All right, so we'll um, <clears throat> we'll get started here. And um, wait a second. All right. Well, uh, happy uh, Monday, you guys. It's uh, it's week five, Monday, and um, and so the uh, the topic this week will be clustering uh, or unsupervised learning. So, um, so we'll uh, we'll get just kind of well. There, I mean, there's a whole bunch of unsupervised learning methods, and um, but we'll start off with clustering. Okay. So so far, all the stuff we've been doing have been supervised learning methods in that. You know, you have your predictor variables, your x's, and based on those, you are trying to um, get them to get the output, the output of your system to match the target values. So every input has a kind of an output, a response variable, and we're trying to match that. So, um, you know, whether it was the neural network or the classifiers, um, what we are trying to minimize is we're trying to, we can measure things like loss, okay, which will be the difference between what we predicted and what the target value is, okay? And if we can get those two to be close, then that's a good performing model. If the predicted and the target value are quite different, then, you know, it's, it's, it's not performing as well. Uh, and that, you know, that's where all of those things like the bias variance trade-off, those are all based on supervised learning methods. All right. Um, uh, with unsupervised learning, on the other hand, uh, we don't have target values. All right. Instead, what we're doing is we're trying to search for uh, structure within the input values alone. Um, and so kind of just two broad applications of, of, um, of unsupervised learning is uh, clustering, which is grouping similar observations together, and also dimension reduction, which is kind of uh, reducing like redundant predictor values. So, um, so we'll take a look at both of these things. And so we'll, uh, we'll start with clustering. <clears throat> the goal of clustering is to kind of create groups of objects that are uh, similar, so that objects within a group are similar to each other and objects from different groups are not similar. That's, that's the idea, right? And so, you know, how do you define similarity? And, um, and that's kind of a, a difficult question. So there's, there's lots of ways to define similarity and there's lots of ways to perform grouping. Um, and, you know, some applications of clustering would be to group similar products together. So, you know, when you shop on Amazon and it uh, suggests products to you, those, those products have been clustered together. Um, you can kind of group similar documents together. So if you want to kind of cluster um, articles or tweets or things or whatever, you can, uh, you can do that. You can also group physical locations together. So uh, for example, if you're uh, designing, you know, an app for Lyft or Uber or whatever it might be, you might want to kind of group physical locations together because, uh, you know, you have ride sharing where, you know, you can like pool with other people and you want to kind of group uh, the routes that are similar uh, to each other. So that's uh, clustering. And so kind of the, uh, the simplest of these um, algorithms for clustering is the K means clustering algorithm. Okay, it's very simple. And the way it defines object similarity is it's going to use Euclidean distance, okay? And so because we're using Euclidean distance, this means kind of our inputs have to be numeric, right? So, you know, if we have categorical variables then, then everything gets a little bit harder. So we're gonna leave things, um, we've got uh, numeric values, so it could work for the iris data set or, you know, any kind of thing where you've got uh, numeric variables. It's important, um, you know, K means clustering and K and N both start with a K. And so sometimes we get these mixed up just because they both start with a K. But um, it's important to remember that K means clustering is unsupervised. There's no target values. 
whereas KNN, K nearest neighbors, is supervised classification. Okay, so um, so that's kind of your your major distinction there. All right, and so in K means clustering, the clusters are going to be defined by the centroids. The centroid is the mean or the center of the points that are assigned to the cluster. So basically you just take all the points that are assigned to the cluster and you take the mean of that. <clears throat> Mathematically, this looks like this, where uh, the mean, the centroid, mu sub k, so that if there's k different clusters, or big k clusters, and we're looking at you know, little k, you know, we're looking at the third cluster or whatever, Okay, that's, that's, that would be mu sub three or mu, mu sub k. This is gonna be the sum of the x values, okay, multiplied by the z, where the z is an indicator variable and it's equal to one if that observation is in cluster k and it's a zero if it's not in cluster k. So when you take x times the z, then um, it'll, it will add up only the ones that are in cluster k and it's gonna be zero for everything that's not in cluster k. So you're adding up all the x's that belong inside cluster k. And then you're gonna divide by the sum of the z's, which will be the sum of the points that belong in cluster k. So it's basically just the mean of the points that belong inside cluster k. And this is how we express that mathematically. All right, sorry, my, my dog's barking. Let me, uh, let me just... He's fine. I don't know what's. I don't know. He's upset. He's been getting a little bit grumpier. He's he's uh, as he's getting to be an older dog, he's been getting grumpier. I was looking up online, and it's like, could be a sign that your dog's going blind. I'm like, oh no, what am I gonna do? Um, but uh, well, we'll see. Okay. Um, all right. So this is um how we can describe the uh, the algorithm. And, um, and so number one, or before you even begin, step zero is decide how many clusters you're going to search for. So should, are you searching for two clusters, three clusters, four clusters? You have to decide. This is not an easy task. It's not an easy question. It's, it's, um, it's difficult, but as far as k-means clustering goes, you need to, you need to decide the k yourself, okay? And then, um, and then the, uh, the first step will be to just randomly assign the points in your data to each of the clusters, okay? And so um, you just randomly assign them. Once all the values have been assigned to a cluster, then you're gonna iterate uh, between these two steps, okay? Uh, and that is, one, number one, you're gonna calculate the centroid you're gonna calculate the centroid of the values inside each cluster. And then the following step is you're going to reassign values to clusters by associating the values in each, in the data set to the nearest centroid. So whichever centroid is nearest, you're gonna assign the points to that, to that centroid and that's gonna form a cluster, okay? And we're gonna use Euclidean distance here. And then um, you go back and you go back to step two, which is recalculate the centroids. And then you do step three, which is reassign the points. And you keep doing this until you reach convergence. Convergence occurs when no values are reassigned to a new cluster. So if the cluster assignments from one place remains the same as the cluster assignments in the next iteration, then you've reached convergence. So here's a, a simple example. I've got these eight data points, and we're going to say let, we're going to look for two clusters. Okay. Now it's very clear when when I have when I have this data, these eight data points in two dimensions, it's very easy to tell that this is one cluster and this is one cluster. Okay. But let me just kind of show you how the algorithm works. All right. So step one or step zero is we're going to determine how how many clusters we're going to look for, and so we're going to just look for two. Okay. 
And then the first step is to just randomly assign the points to a cluster. So I've done this by just sampling the values one and two with replacement and assigning them to the assignments. And then if uh, uh, the Z1, which was zeros or ones, if they belong to cluster one, will be when the assignments equal one. And Z2 is the vector of zeros and ones when the assignments equal two. Okay. And so I've colored them based on their assignments, all right? And so in our initial pass, we have five points assigned to the red cluster and three points assigned to the black cluster, okay? And it's fine that when we did random, random assignment that we got a different number, of um, different number of points in each cluster, that's fine. Now, technically with random assignment, it is possible to end up with a cluster where no points are assigned. And if that happens, then you're gonna to have to redo the, the random assignment because now you, then you'd end up searching for um, fewer clusters. So if you, if you said, let's search for five clusters and one of the clusters have no points randomly assigned to it, then you're gonna end up um, only looking for four clusters. So you'd have to redo that. Now, um, that only becomes a problem if you search for a K that's too high generally. Generally, if, if you search for a reasonable, reasonably sized K, you won't run into the problem where no points get assigned to it. All right, so anyway, we're gonna calculate the centro centroid of the five red points and the center of the five black points, okay? And so these are the coordinates of the points. Okay, so this one's at zero, zero, this one's at one, zero, this is zero, one, this is at one, one. Is that three, three, four, three, three, four, and four, four, okay? So these are the coordinates, all right? And the assignments uh, we're gonna do by kind of multiplying the X vectors by this vector Z, which is ones and zeros. So we only do, do it for the, um, the points that belong to cluster one, all right? So we're gonna add zero, zero, one, one, and four, four. So the uh, x1 coordinate is 0, 1 plus 4, 0 plus 1 plus 4 divided by 3, which is 1.667. And you know, coincidentally, we also have 0, 1, and 4 over here, which is 1.667. And then over here, uh, we've got five points assigned to cluster 2. And we're going to take the mean of those five points. All right. Yeah, so the question is, there's no need to evenly split. There's no need. You can, you, you can force an even split, but it's not necessary. So as far as the five points that belong to cluster two, we're gonna add up those points, zero, one, three, three, and four. And then I do the same thing on the other side, one, zero, three, four, three, and I get the coordinates 2.2, 2.2. So when I plot those, oh, and I could, Rather than doing it this way, I could also just use like dplyr to do a, to do a summarize and we get this, okay? And so here's the, uh, the plot of the centroid. So this is the centroid of the three black points is right here. And the centroid of the five red points is right here. Okay, so if I average these five, then we get this, the average of these three black points ends up right here. And now I'm going to reassign each point to the centroid that is closest. So starting here with this point, it's, it's hard to tell, but there's a, a line I'm measuring the distance from this point to the black line, uh, to the black centroid, and from this point to the red centroid. And we can see, well, it's closer to the black centroid, so it's gonna get assigned to black. Next point. This point, which one is closer? Here's the distance to the black centroid. Here's the distance to the red centroid. The distance to the black centroid is lower, so we assign it to black, okay? Here's the distance from this point to the black centroid, the distance from this point to the red centroid. It's gonna get assigned to black. So I, I go through and all of these get assigned, these four points get assigned to the black centroid because the black centroid is closer to these four points and then these four points get assigned to the red centroid because the red centroid is closer. 
And so this is the points after reassignment. And then after I reassign the points, I recalculate the centroids. So I say, all right, for these four points that are assigned to the black centroid, what's the new centroid here? For these red points over here, what's the new centroid? So the new centroid is 0.5.5 for the black cluster and 3.5, 3.5 for the red cluster. And we get this. All right, so question, what if the distances are the same? So that's gonna be fairly rare. I mean, it's not impossible, but it's fairly rare. Um, and then, so you can just do random assignment at that point, okay? So you can just randomly choose between the, the two clusters, two centroids that are uh, equidistant. Um, but, it, but it's gonna be uh, a rare circumstance unless, unless you have like, you've artificially turned categorical data into numeric data. So you have a whole bunch of observations with kind of the same values, then, then that could happen. But in general, if you have numeric values, it, it will be very rare for distances to, the, to two centroids to be the same. Uh, meaning like one's over here and one's over here and it's exactly in the middle. It's, could happen, right? Um, what are the harms if we have too few or too many number of clusters? Okay, well, uh, I'll talk about that in a little bit, okay? Um, all right, so anyway, this is um, the new centroids and then we would reassign based on which centroid is closer and we, we would see that no, the assignments would not change, right? So after we recalculated the centroids, the assignments remain the same. And so because no points have been reassigned to a new cluster, we say this has reached convergence. And this is what we have. Is that okay? Um, all right, so here's just a, a little bit more data. So here's a new data set. I've got the original data set has three clusters. I've got red, black, and green. And this is what the original data looked like. Our three classes. But when we look at the data, sorry, I shouldn't have started eating here. Um, we don't know the structure, okay? And so I'm gonna just say, we're gonna look for three clusters, but you don't know if you should look for three clusters and you might pick two clusters or four clusters or whatever, okay? So I'm gonna show you what happens when we do three clusters. So I'm gonna say, we're gonna look for three clusters. Step one is to randomly sign all the points. So I just randomly say, some of the points will be black, some of the points will be green, some of the points will be red. And these end up being the, uh, the assignments after randomness. And now I calculate the centroids of, the, of all the points, okay? So I take all the black points and I say, what's the mean of all of those points? I take all the red points, I say, what's, what's the mean of all the red points? Take the green points, what's the mean of all the green points? And get these centroids, okay? And so I plot them and we can see we get green, the green centroid, black centroid, and red centroid. The black centroid and red centroid are very close to each other, okay? So we look at this, this one's 0 0.086 versus 0 0.037, 0 0.025, and 0 0.025. These two centroids are very close to each other, but they're not exactly the same, okay? So now we're gonna reassign all the points to the centroid that is closest. So what happens is, like this point over here, we say, which centroid is the closest? And the difference isn't much, but definitely the green centroid is the closest, okay? So pretty much all these points over here, the green centroid is the closest. Pretty much all these points over here, we ask which centroid is the closest, the red one. It's not closest by a whole lot, but th these ones will get assigned to the red centroid, okay? And then we ask, okay, well, what's gonna get assigned to the black centroid? Well. There's, there might only be a couple, okay? Bet um, so maybe this point right here, maybe, okay, it's hard to tell. Maybe this point, I can't really tell, is it might be closer to the black one versus the red one? I don't know, maybe it's closer to the red one. 
Let's see, this one might be closer to the black one than the red one, okay? So we'll see, we'll see what happens, okay? So anyway, I reassign all the points and it turns out, yeah, all of these get assigned to green, all of these get assigned to red, and apparently for this one, the black centroid is the closest, okay? So even this point right here, the black one is a little bit closer than the green centroid, a little bit closer than the red centroid. So, so these points get assigned to the black centroid. So this is, these are the points after reassignment. And so the next step is then to recalculate the centroids. And we're gonna say, okay, here are all the green points. What's the center of all of the green points? Here are all the red points. What's the center of all the red points? And here are all the black points. What's the center of all the black points? So I recalculate the centroids and this is what I get. Okay, so the center of the, um, all the green points is right here. The center of all the red points here. The center of all the black points is right here. Okay, so that's what we get after recalculating the centroids. And then we go through and we iterate again. And so we say, all right, now that we have recalculated the centroids, let's reassign points to the nearest centroid. Okay, so again, all of these points over here will go to green. All of these points will still be red, okay? But now there's a whole bunch of points like around here that are gonna get assigned to the black centroid, okay? And so we probably would have to draw a line halfway between the green and the black centroids. So maybe somewhere around here. And so, you know, this point will probably get assigned to black, this one right here, whereas these two will get assigned to green, okay? So we're just imagining kind of a, a, a line that splits. So imagine a, a line that connects black to green here, uh, and then we're gonna draw a perpendicular line to that, right? Same thing, black and red, we draw a line here that's perpendic uh, that connects these things, and then a, a line halfway in between that's perpendicular. And so we'll probably get a, a split right here and right right here that will take kind of these points in the in the middle that will go to black uh, and whereas all of these ones will stay green and these ones over here will stay red so let's go ahead all right and so that's this is what we get so this is kind of halfway between black and red um, and so you know we say as far as Euclidean distance goes this one's closer to black than, than red and as far as Euclidean distance goes, this one's closer to black than, than green, okay? Oh, actually this one went to green, right? So the, the halfway point somewhere around here, right? So some of these are like probably right on that borderline, but this one ends up going to green, okay? All right, so now that we've reassigned points, we recalculate the centroid. We say, all right, here are all the green points. Where's the centroid of these green points? Here are all the black points. Where's the centroid of these black points? Here are all the red points. Where's the centroid of all these red points? So we recalculate the centroids and then we repeat the process and we say, all right, let's assign each point to the nearest centroid. So it's iterative. You, you recalculate the centroids, then you recalculate the assignments, then you, or you reassign the points, you recalculate the centroids, you re redo the assignments. So, so from here to here, there's only a small recalculation and, and we see if that affects any of the assignments, okay? Oh, there's, there actually is a change, so it hasn't converged. So I should do it one more time. Sorry, I prematurely put this slide. Okay, so if I do it one more time, there would, I think there would be no changes. So this would be the kind of the converged value. And we can compare kind of our final assignments versus the original points, okay? And so we can see, you know, with our final assignments, there's slight difference, um, but it reco recovered the um, the original values quite well, not not quite so. Okay, there's and again, these original clusters are unknown to us. We don't actually have the target values. Okay, we're just kind of searching for clusters here. Uh, R has a built-in k-means function. You can just type in k-means of your data and how many clusters you're looking for. And then it's gonna produce results and all of the cluster assignments are in this vector cluster, okay? And one thing to note is that when you do k-means clustering, as you're just searching for clusters and there's no inherent meaning to the cluster label, okay? 
So it was, it's just a coincidence that when we did it, the green cluster ended up here, the black cluster ended up in the middle, and the red cluster ended up over here, okay? That was, that was a coincidence, and that, that was a coincidence that our original data was also aligned that way, okay? But when you, um, when you do k-means clustering, here, uh, black ended up in the middle, but red ended up over on the right side, and green ended up on the left side. That is totally fine. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that, okay? The cluster labels are inherently meaningless, okay? You're just saying, this one goes to group A, this goes to group B, and this goes to group C, okay? Somebody else could say, hey, this is group red, this is group green, this is group black. This is group one, this is group two, group three, okay? And there's no inherent meaning to say that group one or group three are, like one has a higher or lower value than, than another group. They're just clusters, all right? And so the, the labels uh, could be different, okay? Um, in certain cases, this, this, is, this can create issues. It's known as the label switching problem, but it's, there, there's, it's just a kind of a, a side effect of the fact that the labels, the group labels are arbitrary and meaningless. There's no, there's no inherent meaning to the, you know, the color or the number or the label of each, of each cluster, okay? So, so don't be alarmed if in your original data, you know that this is group one, group two, and group three, and then when you did k-means clustering, it comes back group three, group one, group two, okay? That's, that's not necessarily wrong. It's just that the, uh, the labels are, are meaningless. So anyway, here's the results of doing k-means clustering with three, three clusters here. This is the output of done, running uh, k-means clustering. It, it will give you the, the means of the three clusters that it searches. And here is the, the uh, vector labels, okay? And it also returns something called the between sum of squares divided by total sum of squares. This is almost like an R squared value, all right? It's a little weird to think of that, but you know, if you just say, well, here's the overall variance of the data, how much of the variance can be explained by having certain clusters? Well, if you take the difference between the total sum of squares that exist in the, all, the whole data set unlabeled and compare it to kind of the sum of squares that exists after you've created points, sum of squares being, you know, the, the sum of the square distances to each centroid, by having these three centroids, you would reduce the sum of, sum of squares by around 86%. So that's, uh, so you're, exp you're able to explain about 86% of the sum of squares. So you can think of this as like an R squared value, okay? And like R squared, the more clusters you add or the more, um, ex uh, not explanatory variables, but the more you add, you can always squeeze out a higher R squared. So adding more clusters to search for will increase this value. Um, so that's, that's just something to note, okay? There's a whole, uh, if you look at the structure of k-means, there's, there's a whole bunch of other stuff, um, but there's kind of the, the, some of the metrics that are useful will be this uh, total within sum of squares, and the between sum of squares, and then this is the within sum of squares. So here, this is just, uh, it's the distance. It's the squared distance from each point. Basically, you square the Euclidean distance, okay, from each coordinate to the centroid um, that, it, that it has found. Okay, before I go on, I just wanna kind of check in with you guys, make sure this is <clears throat> feeling okay as far as how k-means clustering is working here, All right? And this is, again, this is an unsupervised learning method. It, and even though the name sounds a little bit like KNN, okay, k-nearest neighbors is a classification algorithm. It's not iterative. You just take the point and you check the distance to every other point and you classify it based on that. 
k means, it is iterative. You have to use, alternate between recalculating the centroids and reassigning the points, and you don't have group labels, so you don't know if you got it right or wrong. All right, so let me just show you what happens if I did k equals two. So here I'm looking for two clusters. With two clusters, I get kind of an R squared value of around 70%, 69.6, and this is the result. So it just kind of splits it and says, all right, here's um, the black cluster, here's the red cluster, okay? And it just kind of separates these, and it kind of just splits it like this. Um, let me show you what happens when I do K equals four. And so here, you know, for these examples, I'm just using R's built-in K means function. I'm not going through the iterative process here. Okay, so if I do K means with four, this is the result. Okay, I get a R squared value of 87.8. Let me just kind of compare that. With three clusters, I got an R squared of around 86.2 and with four, I get 87.8, and this is the, uh, the resulting four clusters that it has identified. Now, um, let, me, let me read up the help on k-means here. Forget. Um, think okay how many random sets so I think it you have the option of kind of running multiple runs okay so here I've got uh, with k equals four this is one result if I ran it again I can end up getting different results okay so here this is another thing where it converged so this is one result where I get if I do k equals four, and with k equals four, I can also get this, right? So we can see the clusters that it draws are different. This one splits kind of this middle cluster. It kind of correctly identifies the red cluster, the black cluster uh, over here. These seem correctly identified, but this center cluster it kind of splits into up here and, and down here. Over here, um, this one looks kind of correct, and these points, there's really you know, one cluster over here and one cluster over here. It kind of splits them into three, all right? And, and this is a stable solution that if I calculated the centroids and I reassigned all the points to the centroids, the, the assignments would, be, would remain converged and, and they wouldn't get reassigned. And so this is just kind of a, an artifact. Remember in the initial assignments, we started off with just random, randomly assigning the, um, the points to random clusters, right? We, we randomly assign them to different clusters, and then we um, calculated the distance to all each of these things. And so depending on the initial random assignments, you can get different results, right? And they're not, one is not necessarily right or wrong, and sometimes you can get things that look odd, okay? And so I tried and I said, well, what if, what if I ran a whole bunch of these things? Like, this is just results of running k equals four, but I could run it like 30 times, okay? Or 20 times, I think is what I did. So I said, what if I tried using k equals four and I ran that 20 times, how would my results change? So, so again, this is just two examples with, with this one. The first time I ran k equals four, I got an R squared of 87.8. And then the second time I ran it with k equals four, I got an R squared of 88.0. So I'm getting slightly different, different values. And so I said, well, you know what, what I'm gonna try doing is I'll try doing k equals one cluster and I'll run it 20 times, see if I get different results. Then I'll try doing k equals two clusters, running it 20 times, see if I get different results. I'll do k equals three clusters, and I'll run that 20 times, see if I get different results. I'll run k equals four clusters, and I'll run that 20 different times, 
and maybe some of the times I'll get 87.8, sometimes I'll get 88.0, maybe sometimes I'll get a totally different result. Okay, so I'm doing kind of a double loop and I'm gonna try out k from one through 10 and then I'm gonna just kind of take a look at the uh, total within sum of squares to see how they might change from 20 different runs. Okay, so the question. So to clarify, even though we have split the middle group incorrectly, the number of groups doesn't affect the R squared value because the groups are really arbitrary. In other words, it's just important that the values are in different groups, not that. Uh, I wouldn't say that. So, so here <laughs> I got R squared 87.8 and here I got R squared 88.0. Um, the, the, again, the goal is not that we're increasing our R squared, okay? The R squared is kind of a, it's a helpful metric but it's, it's not necessarily that we're gonna maximize the R squared. Because if that was the goal, the goal would just, that we would just pick the maximum largest number of K, right? So, and again, it, the, you can't do cross-validation because you don't have the correct answers, right? So cross-validation only works when you have a training set and a testing set, and you can evaluate the performance of your training set, and you can evaluate the performance of your test set. But we don't have the answers here. It's unsupervised. So we're trying to we're trying to decide we're trying to decide how many uh, clusters to look for. But this is this is not a trivial question. Okay, searching for the number of clusters is is very difficult. Okay, um, so we're not necessarily looking for r squared. Um, but you know, kind of one indicator is maybe like stability in terms of the cluster assignments. And so with k equals four, we're, we don't really have a lot of stability, so it's probably not the best. But but maybe it's okay. I don't know. Um, you can take a look at kind of um, the the graph, the resulting graph. So I'm gonna I'll show you the resulting graph here. And so when I did this is just kind of the beginning, the head and the tail. So when I had k equals one, the within sum of squares is exactly the same. With k equals two, the within sum of squares is exactly the same for all the results. But with k equal 10, the within sum of squares differs a little bit from each run, okay? And so I can kind of plot this, and, uh, and these are like mini box plots. And so we could say with k equal to four, there's a little bit of variance and five, six, seven, you know, there's a little bit of variance here. And we get this kind of this L shape where there's significant drops from going from one to two to three clusters. But then as I increase the number of clusters, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, yes, the within sum of squares continues to drop, but the amount of improvement is, is small. And if you looked at the results, the uh, there's quite a bit of, variation and uh, the results differ from each other uh, a little bit. The, um, so here's an analogy. And I don't know if this is a great analogy, but you might ask, well, how many, um, like on a census form, right? So I don't know if you filled out a census form this year, but one of the questions they have are like on racial demographics. And this is always kind of a, a, a question is, how many racial groups should we pick? How many, how many groups are there, right? And, uh, and you might say, well, on the, don't even bother, there's only one race, there's just the human race, okay? Fine, right? Uh, for the United States, maybe what you can, you can split it into two and you can say you have white and you have people of color, okay? Um, or you can say uh, maybe you want to split into three and you can say there's white, um, black, or people of African descent and um, other, okay? Or you can say, well, maybe we need four groups and you can have um, uh, white, uh, black, or African, um, Latino, Hispanic, um, Asian, I don't know, right? And then and let's say, okay, even, um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm Asian, but 
even with Asian, you can split that further and have even more groups, right? You can say, well, we have East Asian and South Asian and Southeast Asian. And then uh, for even the East Asian group, you can split that further into, you know, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, and that could even get split even further. Any of those groups can get split further. So how many groups, how many clusters should we look for is, is very hard, right? It's, it's not an easy an question to answer because someone can always say, well, you know what? It's not quite right to group all of these people together. They're, they are distinct, right? Chinese, Japanese, Korean, they are, they are distinct ethnicities. And should we group them together? Should we separate them? If we separate them, should we separate these other groups? You know, um, is it correct to group all of Scandinavia together or do we need to distinguish uh, Norway from Sweden, from Finland and Denmark? And, you know, uh, how, many, how many things are there, right? And, you know, um, the, uh, you know, the American Indian or indigenous people of the Americas, there were, you know, so many different tribes and, you know, we kind of lumped them all together and, you know, is, is that right? You know, so the question of how many clusters to search for, even just for, for people is, is very complicated. All right. And there's a lot of, you know, also just historical and cultural baggage that come, comes with that question. But even just from even a, a sterilized data set where you don't have that, the, the question of how many clusters you should search for is, is, is difficult because probably the argument can always be made that the, um, you know, even within this group, there are differences and maybe we should separate these into, into different groups. And so, um, I don't know. I don't know how to, <laughs> I don't know how to answer this. And so, you know, one, one kind of guiding thing is, well, you look at the improvement in the within sum of squares that comes with choosing different numbers of K and you say, well, at what point is the improvement by adding more and more groups? At what point does that difference um, not adding more, not make a huge difference? So that's, um, it's a guideline, but you know, this is, this is not, not an easy question to answer. How many, how many groups do we have? Uh, in the slide where you write the code for choosing K, K where does it come into play? Uh, you mean this slide right here? So, so for here, what I've done is I said, well, you know what, let's run two loops, a loop within a loop. So we're going to alter, change K from one through 10. And that K comes in right here when I'm just calling R's K means clustering function. So there's a K means. So R has a built in K means clustering function. Part of your homework, you're going to have to kind of code up some k-means clustering functionality yourself, which um, um, is something you're going to do. But here I'm going to just say, well, let's try k equal to 1. And then when the loop runs again, we're going to try k equal to 2, k equal to 3, all the way up to k equal to 10. And then even though k for each of these things, k is um, going to maybe stay 4, I'm going to run run it 20 different times, okay? Because every time I run k-means clustering, it's gonna do the initial random assignments a little bit differently. And because the initial random assignments are a little bit differently, the, uh, the cluster assignments that it converges to can differ. So this is one run with certain assignments, and these are the cluster assignments it gets. And Here's another run where I do the uh, cluster assignments with a different random initial starting point, and I get different assignments at the end. And with these kind of different results, the total sum, sum of squares are uh, within sum of squares, uh, total within sum of squares will, will differ a little bit, okay? Um, so we get slightly different numbers, and, and I'm gonna record all of that, okay? So inside the data frame, I'm recording this total within sum of squares. Okay. Yeah, so it's basically like having a different set seed value. Yeah, I, but except I didn't bother even setting the seed. I'm just having it just do its random run here. So we get 
we get these things, okay? So just the guideline is, yeah, we see big drops when we go from k equal to one to two to three. And after k equal to three, it continues to improve and people can probably make different arguments for why there should be four clusters or five clusters or six clusters. Um, but the, the bottom line is the amount of improvement in kind of the um, within some of squares uh, is not huge and but should we should we make it I don't know so um, so that's what we have there all right why don't we take a, a short break here and then we'll come back and we'll do um, k-means clustering with kernel functions which will allow us to kind of identify uh, I guess some interesting clusters in not necessarily you know your traditional linear um, divisions. So we'll take uh, we'll take five minutes here. Starting. Uh, you don't understand about the within sum of squares. Okay. Um, let's see. How do I I do this? I need to uh, kind of draw something here. Uh, oh, okay. okay. So, um, so the within sum of squares. So here would be the distance. We would take the squared distance from each point to its own cluster. All right. So the uh, the within sum of squares will be um, from this dot to this dot. Okay, we take that distance. So this is, so uh, this centroid is 0.5, 0.5, and this point is 1, 1. So this distance is 0.5 squared plus 0.5 squared. And then we would do it for these, and we'd have 0.5 squared plus 0.5 squared, 0.5 squared, 0.5 squared. So um, 2. And then I think over here we'd also have 2. We would have a total of within sum of squares of uh, four. And then um, the total sum of squares would be each point to the centroid, the kind of the grand centroid uh, of all of the points, which would just be two, two. Like if we put them all in one cluster, what's the, um, uh, how many, what's the sum of squares? And that would be right here in this kind of this center point right here, two, two. And, uh, and we would measure the square distance from each, each point to to the, uh, the grand centroid there. Um, so the within sum of squares, ideally, is that within the groups, it, it's small, that the distance from each group to its own centroid, the, the points are quite similar, and we have a, um, a small total within sum of squares. I don't know if that helps, okay. Uh, another question, uh, how do we choose um, the number K? Do we choose the least number of clusters when there's not much improvement? Yeah, that's kind of the general guideline. Um, so uh, within sum of squares is going to be a vector for each uh, cluster. So you'd have the within sum of squares for this cluster, and you have the within sum of squares for this cluster. And then the total within sum of squares, you would add up for all the clusters. So if you looked at the results, uh, so when I did for two clusters, the within sum of squares is 666 and 690, and then the total within sum of squares, which uh, is not displayed here, um, oh, okay, so with three clusters, these are the within sum of squares, and so we have these numbers, and then the total sum of, uh, total within sum of squares is the sum of those three values. That's the total within. Okay. And then the total sum of squares is four, four, six, three. And that's going to be if you put all of the clusters into one um, into one cluster, what would you get? Okay. And so the uh, the ratio, this this number 86.2 is uh, if you do uh, four four six three minus six seventeen, 
you would get 3846 and you do 3846 divided by 4463 and you would get 86.2. Um, similar things for these, I didn't, I didn't show the, uh, the details on, on those ones. But the within sum of scores is going to be a vector for each of the three, each, each cluster that, that's identified. And then the total within sum of scores is going to be the sum of these numbers. And then the, in the results, this 86.2 is going to be the between sum of squares divided by the total sum of scores. Um, oh, quiz answers. I forgot to give you any of the quiz answers. Did I give you any of them? None of them? Okay. All right, I'll give you the first two. First two are B and C, um, bear and coyote, or cat. I don't know. I think we had this conversation earlier about the bear cats, right? Okay, so uh, first quiz answer is B as in bear, and second quiz answer is C as in cat. Is that all right for the... Um, Discussion of the total and within sum of scores. Oh, okay. All right. So this is just kind of review. Um, so here it is for the k-means clustering. All right. So kernelized k-means clustering will work like this. Okay. So if you recall, we did kernel functions when we were doing support vector machines, and when we did support vector machines, the idea of the kernel function is that it is taking each point that exists in a lower dimensions and lower number of dimensions and it somehow transforms it from a lower number of dimensions to a higher number of dimensions so the ones that we were able to illustrate is we had data in two dimensions and we transformed it to exist in three dimensions and once you transform it into three dimensions then you could draw some kind of plane a hyperplane to separate to, to um, use a, kind of a, uh, a linear, you can make them linearly separable. And that's how the support vector machines work with clusters. And we use the 2D to 3D example, and we said there are other kernel functions like the radial basis function or the Gaussian kernel, which takes your data that exists in the lower dimensions and transforms them into infinite dimensions, which our brains cannot comprehend. But you don't actually have to calculate the transformation itself. You can just find kind of the appropriate kernel function and the result of the appropriate kernel function will give you the, um, the resulting kind of inner product or dot product between the, um, um, between the transformed vectors, okay? And that inner product dot product is just gonna be a single scalar value. And so you don't actually have to know the values that where it was transformed. You don't actually need to know those transformed values. I hope that's okay. And so uh, one example that I did was we can go from 2D to 3D where we went from the points x1 and x2 into a three-dimensional vector where we still where we maintain x1 x2 and the third coordinate is going to be x1 squared plus x2 squared and if you do the inner product of these where you transform vector xa and vector xb into x uh, xa1 xa2 and xa1 squared plus xa2 squared and you take the uh, kind of the inner product or dot product with xb1, xb2, xb1 squared, and xb2 squared, then the result will end up being this, which uh, can be rewritten as xa dot, dotted with xb plus norm of xa squared plus norm x2 squared. Okay, right. And so, so these, the kernel function the kernel function is equivalent to transforming x1 and x2 into three three-dimensional coordinates and taking the the uh, the dot product or the inner product of those things but you don't actually have to 
you don't actually have to um, transform the values. You can just go straight to this and you don't have to do any transformations. Here's a, another example of a kernel function. So if you have, so this is the known as the polynomial kernel and you can, you can mess around with this, but if you have, if you set C equal to zero and you choose gamma equal to two, then the equivalent transformation function would be this, going from x1 to, and x2 to x1 squared, x2 squared, and root two, x1, x2. And you can kind of follow the math through this. I'm not gonna bother reading every single line here, but the resulting um, inner product is this. And so again, you don't have to worry about the actual transformation here, you can just go straight to this kernel function, which is going to be a scalar value that we can use to kind of measure, um, kind of measure uh, the distance between points. All right, and again, the Gaussian kernel or the radial basis function kernel, the resulting kernel function value is this. Uh, and it's equivalent to taking the vectors, transforming them into infinite dimensions, and then taking the inner product there. All right, so all kernel functions are inner products of vectors after they've been transformed by the function phi, but we don't even need to think of the transformation itself, all right? And so, because this is an inner product of, of this, um, we can, we can substitute the kernel function for kind of any inner product that exists in the original space. So the next couple of slides are going to get a little bit, a little bit crazy here, okay? Because, um, well, let me let me illustrate what I'm going to do, okay? And uh, and then and then maybe I'll come back and do the math here. Okay, so here is, I've got eight data points. I've got four in the middle and then four on the edges here. Now, if I used k-means clustering, so I'm gonna go a little bit out of order here. I'm gonna just go ahead. So these are my eight data points. I've got four in the middle, four in the outer edges. And if I use just plain old k-means clustering, it would not be able to, it would never put the, this point and this point in the same cluster because it's using Euclidean distance. So according to Euclidean distance, this point is much more similar to this point because the Euclidean distance is a lot smaller than it is to this point. Euclidean distance says these two points are about as different as they can possibly be. And maybe that's true, okay? But from a kernel perspective, we might say, you know what, the four points in the middle, let's cluster them together and the four points on the edges, let's cluster those together. All right, so in this case, maybe Euclidean distance is not the best solution, all right? And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna transform them into, um, into 3D, all right? So I'm gonna go take the coordinates, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, which is this one here, and this is uh, 0 0.1, negative 0 0.1, and this is negative 0 0.1, negative 0 0.1, and this is, you know, so these are point 0.1 and then these are have the coordinates too. So I'm going to transform them each point into the 3D coordinate, x1, x2, and x1 squared and x2 squared. And, uh, and these will be the kind of the resulting coordinate in three dimensional space. And I can actually graph this using, uh, to show up here. Uh, let's, where's my plot 3D GL? Okay. 
Where's my... Oh, sorry. This is the thing I want. Okay, right here. So, um, just like regular old uh, k-means clustering, so this is where I've actually transformed them into 3D. Okay, I've transformed them into 3D. I'm going to randomly assign the points to clusters one and clusters two. Okay, so these ones end up in cluster one, and uh, and then these three, uh, these five end up in cluster two. And so when I plot them in 3D, I hope you guys can see this. All right, is I've got these. Um, I've got two points in red down here, and then three points in red up here. Okay, and so the centroid, the centroid in three-dimensional space of the three red points is this dot right here, and the centroid of the three blue points in three-dimensional space is this dot down here. Okay, so if I look from above, we can see because I've got points here, 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 um, the centroid gets pulled in this direction, and then because I've got two here and one over here, the blue centroid gets pulled in that direction. Okay. And if I look at um, look at it in from this perspective, it's a little bit hard to control this graph. We can see, you know, I've got three points in red up top and two points on the bottom, so the red gets pulled towards the top. And then over here, I've got two points on the bottom and one point in blue on the top, and so the blue centroid ends up down here. Okay, so this is uh, these are the centroids that exist in 3D. And then based on these centroids, we're going to do reassignments using k-means clustering. Okay. So I calculate the centroids and I plot those, and that's what these dots here represent. And then um, I calculate the distance from each point to the centroids. So I can say, well, how far is how far is this? coordinate to this coordinate and what is that the distance to centroid a and what's the distance to centroid b okay and so this is you know this minus this squared plus this minus this squared plus this minus this squared and the distance to centroid a gets calculated to be 7.98 and the distance to centroid b ends up getting calculated to be 23.26 and i do this for all eight points and i say okay well which which centroid is closer right and so these the four points on the bottom will get thrown to centroid, uh, I think, the blue centroid because it's um, closer to them. And then I think the ones up top will get classified to the red centroid because it's closer than the, than the blue one here, okay, at least in our diagram. So this is, th these are the distances that it has calculated from the, uh, the points to each of these centroids. And then so I reassign them. Uh, accordingly, and I recalculate the centroids. And so the resulting plot that I get there, after I run this and run this, okay, so this is the resulting plot with the, um, so th these four points got assigned to the first uh, the red centroid and these four points got assigned to the blue centroid and then when I recalculate the centroid of the current cluster assignments the centroid of the red points is right here and the centroid of the blue points is down there okay and I think that that makes sense is that are you does that make sense what's happening here so I've taken the data and using um, the kernel function I'm projecting it from two-dimensional space to three-dimensional space. And then we calculate, um, we do k-means clustering in this higher dimensional space. Right. So uh, in order to know that, didn't you already have a bias about which elements belong together? Yeah, this is, this is, a, <laughs> this is an example, okay? Uh, this is just a toy example, and it doesn't necessarily have to be so, okay? So, again, you could look at this original data and just say, well, let's use Euclidean distance, and then it would cluster them according to Euclidean distance, 
Now here I thought, well, maybe, maybe the center ones should belong together and these outer ones should belong together. All right. Yeah, I had I had an idea of where I'm going to, and so I kind of picked an appropriate kernel that would uh, achieve that. Okay. Um, what we can do, all right, is that we don't actually we don't actually have to transform the data into the higher dimensions and then calculate the distance in the higher dimensions. That's what I've, I've done that using these things to illustrate it because we can, we can visualize this. We can say, all right, when I take my two dimensional data and put it into 3D, this is what the resulting 3D looks like. I can calculate a centroid in three dimensions and I can calculate the distance to each centroid in this three dimensional space, all right? We know how to do that. But what if I said, I want you to do it in infinite dimensional space, okay? Now we can't, we can't do that, all right? We can't visualize it, and we would not actually be able to calculate the coordinate in infinite dimensional space because that coordinate would be uh, in, in infinitely long. And, um, but the, so even though, so we, we can't even, we don't even know what the coordinate of each point is in this infinite dimensional space. So, but the distance, the distance is just a scalar, right? So from one point to another point, even though the coordinate has infinitely many dimensions, the distance is just a scalar value, right? Distance is always just a scalar value. So can we get the distance even without finding the coordinate? And the answer is yes, you can, okay? You can, you can find it by using the kernel functions, okay? So this is uh, how we can measure the distance to a centroid, okay? If we have it in, um, in, in kind of the current, um, current space, okay? So in regular, in your current, um, D-dimensional space, not your infinite dimensional space. You can just take the coordinate of your X point, the coordinate of the centroid, and the square distance. The square distance would just be X minus mu transpose X minus mu. Okay. The centroid, mu sub K, is given by basically the sum of the Z's times the X divided by the number of points in cluster K. And so that's what I'm doing here. I'm taking, I'm just replacing the formula of mu sub k with the formula for the centroid. And when you expand that out, you get this. You can kind of combine terms. This term and this term ends up are exactly the same. Okay, we're just kind of a change in subscripts here. And we can combine these. Mama? And I got a kind Mama? of a double. Actually, Mama? Hang on. Okay, so um, this is kind of the result. And what we can do is with all of these inner products, these inner products here, is we can kind of come up with a kernelized version of it, okay? The distance is, um, the distance to each centroid is, can be expressed with this, just with inner products, and we can get a kernelized distance by just replacing all of these inner products of x transpose x with the kernel function of x kernel of x and x n and things like that. Okay, so this is the kernelized distance to the centroid, which, if you look at this, this just uses the kernel functions and doesn't actually require us to perform any kind of transformation function phi to the uh, to the vector itself. Right, and so it's a it's a little bit hairy looking, but, uh, but it works, okay? And so, all right, so this is just kind of the pictures of what we did of us taking the 2D data and transforming it to 3D, okay? And so uh, take a look at this page, page 83. So this is the result of taking my coordinate, 
in 2D, transforming it into a 3D coordinate. So I have x1, x2, x3. And then I calculated the centroids in 3D, and I got those distances. And I did this just doing kind of the, the traditional, traditional uh, Euclidean distance. Right, if I take uh, this coordinate, so if I call this uh, U1, and then I call this just X1, I can just do uh, mu1 minus, or I should do x1 minus mu1. x1 minus mu1 is this, and I'm going to take uh, this thing and I'm going to just square each value, and then I would sum them up, right? Okay, and so the, the squared distance from x1 to mu1, 7.984, is this value here, right? So I'm just taking the difference between this and this, and I'm squaring those and adding them up, right? And if I did it, for here, then I would get this value right here, 23.264. Okay, 23.264, yep. So that's just the difference between each of these points squaring them, okay? So this is a uh, slide 83. This, these are the distances I've calculated just kind of using the Euclidean distance formula. Um, again, what we can do is we can get the kernelized distance without actually transforming the data, right? I can just take the kind of the kernelized uh, value uh, from each of these things, knowing that the kernel function is going to be uh, the corresponding kernel function for our transformation is this xa dot xb plus xa norm squared plus times xb norm squared. And so to, to do this, this, uh, you know, mathematically, it's a little bit, a little bit of a pain because what I'm, what it requires me to do is I have to create a, a matrix, a kernel matrix, okay, a kernel matrix of basically every kind of possible matching between uh, two, two different um, uh, kind of coordinates here, okay? So, so I'm gonna construct the kernel matrix for every kind of, uh, for every value, every um, kind of pair of values that I have, right? So I have eight, um, eight values in my data set, so my kernel matrix will be an eight by eight matrix of kernel distances, okay? So these are kind of the, Kernel, uh, kernel values from for each of these coordinates, and then I can calculate the uh, each of these things. So this is just a whole bunch of code to kind of calculate each of these things. So I'm going to start off by calculating the double sum, um, and I'm going to just go through uh, each coordinate and uh, and add them up for all all r's one through n and all m's one through n. Okay, so this is. This is a loop within a loop, which is highly inefficient, but uh, I think it kind of, it's, it's useful at least math, <laughs> to go from the mathematical notation to the code notation. I think this is easy to see what's happening. Maybe, maybe it's not. I'm just starting off with double sum A equal to zero. And then I'm gonna just add on, uh, you know, the value Z A sub M, Z A sub R. Okay, and again, Z A's are, whether a point belongs to a value or not. And then I'm gonna multiply it by the, the value in the kernel matrix, the coordinate M and R. And so I just keep adding that up for all values R one through N and all values M one through N, okay? And the, the result of that is 72.6416, okay? A more efficient method rather than doing the double sum is a, uh, you can just kind of play around with a little bit of matrix multiplication and you can get this. Yeah, I, I'm not expecting you guys to have figured out how to get the equivalent of the double sum using some vectorized formula, okay? But the vectorized formula can be done using this and, uh, and you, you, know, you do the 
um, matrix outer matrix multiplication of the uh, the ZA vector uh, and do an element wise multiplication with the kernel matrix and you can get the same here okay um, so this works this also works so this one's a little bit more efficient but don't sweat it and so anyway I plug all of that in to get my distances and the important thing is that if you look at the distances this is the distances uh, from each uh, this should say match slide 83, the distances to um, the centroid A can be calculated here without having done any of the transformations. So if I go back to slide 83, notice this column, 7.984, 8.251, 7 7.7177, 7.984. Uh, we have the same value, 7.984, 8.2, 7.717, 7.984. The distances to the centroids are, are the same values, okay? And here I have found those distances to the centroid A by using the kernel function, the kernel function, without having to actually um, transform the data from 2D into 3D, okay? I think transforming the data into 2D to 3D in my brain, this is easier to think about. It makes sense. I, I can visualize the transformation from 2D to 3D. Okay, I can visualize that. I can visualize the centroid in 3D, and I can visualize the distance in 3D. Okay, this one's a little bit more abstract in that I didn't actually transform the data, but somehow I'm still able to calculate a distance to a centroid that I never actually calculated. All right. And this, this sounds so strange, right? But, I'm get, but if you look at the numbers, the numbers are exactly the same. I never actually calculated. I'm just using this distance formula directly using these kernel functions. And somehow I'm getting the same numbers, okay? I never actually calculated the centroid because the centroid could exist in 3D or a higher dimensional space. I never actually calculated the centroid. Uh, and I never actually calculated the new coordinate in the higher dimensional space, but I'm still somehow able to calculate these distances. It's a little bit mind blowing and it's a little bit, uh, if you are confused as how this even works, you're not, you're not alone. It took me a, a while to figure out, like, accept that this even works, okay? But if you look at the numbers, the numbers are exactly the same. And if I do go to the other slide, okay, so these are the, distances to centroid B. Again, I didn't, in, in this thing, I didn't actually calculate the centroid, but I'm getting the same numbers, okay? 23.264, 23.104, and we get the same thing. 23.264, 23.104, 23.424. I'm still getting the same distances to, to the new centroids using just this kernelized distance function. And, and again, it did, did not require that I find, I didn't actually have to produce the data transformed into three dimensions. Um, and so from here, I can reassign points using, current, um, do the cluster assignments, just like the regular k-means uh, clustering by assigning each point to the closer cluster or the closer centroid. And, uh, and we get the, uh, the answers there, okay? And I recalculate the distances, and, and here we go. The distances to centroid A and the distances to centroid B are equal to this. And again, it did not require that I transform the data into that higher dimensional space. And so, so with this, um, here's an example where I have uh, a picture like this, and I'm gonna just use a Gaussian kernel, and again, Get the Gaussian kernel exists in um, infinite dimensional space. So it's hard for us to even comprehend or visualize what's happening. This is the result of if I try using k-means clustering with two clusters here. And, uh, and this is what we get. Yeah, this is not a pokeball. Yeah, uh, this is the result of k-means clustering using Euclidean distance. And so using Euclidean distance, this is not ideal because, um, you know, in this thing, 
it's saying the the center cluster is you know this is an artificial toy data set right but um you know this may or may not be the ideal clustering and if i ran this again um we could imagine just different kind of rotations of this and which one's going to be correct okay so it's using Euclidean distance here. So if I do uh, kernelized k-means clustering, what I can do is I can use the Gaussian or the radial basis function for a kernel. And then again, this is transforming it into infinite, infinite dimensional space here. And so I start off with random assignments and it's gonna iterate between, um, you know, uh, or it's going to iteratively reassign the points to the closest centroid, okay? Uh, and the mind-blowing thing here is that it's not even going to calculate the centroid itself. It just somehow calculates distances to the centroid without actually calculating the centroid itself, okay? And so it's just going to say, all right, which centroid is closer? And it's going to say centroid one or centroid two, and it's going to reassign points based on that but it's not actually calculating the location of the centroid. The location of the centroid exists in infinite dimensional space, so we can't even display that coordinate, okay? So it's gonna just find the distances to centroid A and the distances to centroid B, and it's gonna just apply, and it's gonna just say, pick the centroid that's closer. And so after one iteration, this is what it gets. After two iterations, here's what we get. And then after five iterations, this is the resulting assignment. All right. Um, I don't know if that's impressive <laughs> or, or if this is just confusing. And um, so I was trying to think like, is there anything that is, that is comparable, okay? Is there, is there any example that's comparable? Um, and so this is what I thought of. I don't know. I don't know if this is a good example. Okay. <laughs> I was trying to think of what, what could be comparable to the idea of what is more similar without actually calculating the centroid, right? Because for me, the idea of transforming it from 2D into 3D and then calculating the centroid in three dimensional space and then calculating the distance, like this is easy to visualize. And, and I'm assuming, is that easy to visualize for you guys also? Doing the actual transformation or is, is the actual transformation just as confusing? So this is transforming it from 2D, projecting it into 3D and then calculating the distances in 3D, okay? Yeah. So I think this makes it easy. Visualizing it in three-dimensional space makes it easier. Um, but then without visualizing it in, from 2D to 3D, we're talking about calculating distance to a centroid and we haven't even calculated that centroid. That seems so weird, right? So, so here's, here's my analogy, all right? So I don't, I don't know. I, I tried to pick some actors that you guys might be familiar with. Okay, so here we have uh, Chris Evans as uh, Captain America. And um, okay, so this is, here's Chris Evans. And then we have uh, Chris Hemsworth, all the Chris's, right? So Chris Hemsworth as Thor. All right, and uh, who else? Who did I pick? Oh, Jason Momoa as Aquaman. All right, so here's Aquaman here. And then, um, okay, so we have these, all right? And then, um, and perhaps uh, in another cluster, we've got uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Um, this is what he looks like. And Jesse Eisenberg. And then Adam Scott. Um, and so these are, um, okay. So, so these are, these are all kind of successful actors, all right? 
but we might cluster them differently, right? Like these, <laughs> I, I don't know if we have, um, if there's a, you know, how you would describe each of these things, okay? Each, or not things, each of these actors, okay? How, how you would describe them, but we would probably say, okay, well, you know, these are, you know, they're playing these superhero types. Um, they're supposed to be, you know, representing, you know, sheer brute force strength, okay? Whereas, you know, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, Jesse Eisenberg, Adam Scott, you know, you imagine that they would be better in a battle of wits rather than just straight brawn, right? And, and so if we had a new, uh, a new point and we want to cluster this new point, okay, a new actor, so, so for example, Martin Freeman, Okay, how would we how would we cluster him? Okay, maybe maybe it doesn't quite fit, but so the idea here is that there is no actual centroid, right? Like, what is the centroid? Is there a centroid? Is there an average of these <laughs> these three actors? Is there an average or a centroid of these three actors? And the answer is there is not really a centroid, right? Like, the the centroid of like different people that that's hard to exist uh, hard to visualize that that quite doesn't exist but we can just say well how similar so the idea of a centroid doesn't really exist for these people but how similar is this this person to each of these others right and we can say well this person is probably pretty different from these maybe uh you know not that similar to this but maybe similar to this maybe kind of similar to this i don't know you know and so so we're measuring the idea of like how similar are these points to each other without actually having to calculate a centroid and so by kind of measuring the similarity there even using the kernel kernelized function as a as a metric of similarity or a measure of distance um we we can still kind of comprehend and say, all right, this new point or this new person that we've observed uh, can be better classified in, uh, in one of these groups, right? And so, you know, and then you get like kind of oddities of like Chris Pratt who went from um, Chris Pratt and Parks and Rec, you know, is quite different, right? Okay, so this is quite the uh, transformation right so you know how would how would you classify or something or this is this is different but that would be that would be a case of a point moving coordinates somewhere in your in your dimensional space i don't know if that's a good analogy but it's the idea of still being able to talk about how points are similar to each other even though you've never actually calculated the centroid okay whereas you know i think e it's easier to visualize the three-dimensional centroid and things like that. I think that's easier. But, but the impressive thing is that you can use this kernelized function and measure the distance to a centroid without actually finding the centroid itself. Um, okay, that's, uh, that's all I've got for today. Uh, I don't know if you guys have any questions. Oh, let me give you your last quiz answer. Last quiz answer is E as an elephant. E as an elephant is your last quiz answer. Do we have class on Labor Day? Okay, um, so I was mulling this over and uh, we'll see how much I cover. Uh, okay, so on, so on Wednesday, I'm gonna go over the EM algorithm and then I have to cover um, PCA, all right? And then, um, and then I, I kind of just wanted to have like one day for catch, catch up and review. Um, this is what I'm thinking. I'm thinking I will do um, uh, for Labor Day. What I'm thinking is I will have a lecture on Monday, but I will extend the view quiz all the way until like Thursday of that week. Okay. Oh, and I, I did miss Friday's office hours, and I apologize for that. I guess um, I guess I can have office hours later today. Like, give me a break after class at three o'clock. I guess. Well, class is going to end a little bit early, and I can come back at three o'clock and then I can have office hours at three. Um, so anyway, th uh, this is my plan. 
is I'm going to have a, a lecture on Monday of sixth week. It's Labor Day, okay? And, and I'll have this here. But if you want to take the day off, if you, want, if you have something planned for Labor Day, that's totally fine. And, uh, and I will record the lecture, and, uh, and then there will be a viewing quiz that won't be due until Thursday. And then, um, and then on Wednesday, I'll have like an optional time where I can, I don't know, maybe do a little bit of catch up or something, uh, just cover some uh, uh, other things. Maybe it'll be a shortened lecture, um, whatnot. And then, um, and then we'll have the final exam on Friday. So, uh, so that'll be the plan that we have. Okay, any questions? Oh, are you allowed to discuss the midterm on campus wire? Uh, uh, I'd rather you not. If you have questions about the midterm, you can come to office hours and I'll, I'll happily answer um, any of your answers or any of your questions there. So um, uh, we'll, we'll leave it at that. Um, so uh, there's no curve to the midterm. I think the overall, I forgot the, uh, the distribution of scores. But the, uh, I think the median was like a, I'll have to check. <laughs> I'll have to check, but it was, a, it was pretty, uh, it was pretty high. Well, I post a rubric for the midterm. Is, are, do you not get to see like what points were deducted on the, um, in grade scope? I think, I think on grade scope, it, it'll tell you why you lost points. I think, maybe, maybe not. Um, if you go to grade scope. It just says correct and incorrect on grade scope. Huh. Okay. I'll uh, I'll have to check the uh, the settings, but I think um, when you the TA clicks on that thing, it'll tell you um, the the comments or something, or at least which section got you got right or wrong. So if you have questions, uh, I'll I'll have my answer in office hours. Okay. So we'll um um. So we'll end here for now, and then um, uh, I'll have office hours from three to four uh, today. So uh, I'll take a short break here, and then uh, at three o'clock. So I don't know the average off the top of my head, but it was pretty high. It was something, I wanna say like 87? I don't know, don't, don't quote me on that. Something around there, okay? Uh, I, I, I don't see a problem with the uh, the, I didn't see an issue with the uh, the average there. Third quiz answer today is E. Third quiz answer today is E. I'll uh, I'll look up the stats for the midterm, and uh, and I'll, I'll I'll share those with you. So, okay, uh, we'll end here, and we'll see you guys uh, on Wednesday or at three o'clock for office hours. So uh, so we'll there. Have a good day, you guys.